Hello everyone, this is Michael and I'm the lead developer for the ShapeDiver Viewer. This video and the others that will follow are tutorial series for the ShapeDiver Viewer API. I will guide you through the different features and will show you step by step how to use the Viewer API to build amazing applications. If you have questions that are not answered by this video, have a look at our help desk, the API documentation or ask a question in the forum. Links to all of those are in the description below. In this first video, we will start slowly by first of all explaining some terminology and provide some background information. In the second part of this video, we will already start with our first simple application to get things started. So let's start right off. I started as a developer at in 2017 as a project from university. After the project I was hired and I haven't left ever since. My responsibility at ShapeDiver is the viewer, which is a WebGL viewer built with 3GS and is written in TypeScript and provided via an npm package and a CDN. Okay, for some that might have been a lot of terminology in one sentence, so let's start off slow. First of all, what is ShapeDiver? ShapeDiver provides 3D rendering and automation software that is used by our clients to display their products in 3D on their online stores and to generate production files from every order. The ShapeDiver viewer is part of the products of ShapeDiver, in this means we are responsible for visualizing the content that comes from our servers. Via the viewer API it is also possible to change parameters, read out outputs, request exports and generally interact with the Grasshopper model on our servers. There are also many more features like augmented reality, interactions, animations and much more that we will get into over time. If you are interested in knowing more, you can watch some of the videos on our company channel like this webinar that was done recently that shows off our new platform and a lot of the features it provides. For visualization, we currently use 3 js an awesome graphics library that uses WebGL to render the contents in 2D and 3D. If you are interested in learning more about 3 js and WebGL, there are links in the description. Um, you don't need to know any of this, but for some advanced features, it might come in handy at some point. Regarding the programming language, we use TypeScript. TypeScript is a typed language and is built on JavaScript. It just makes your life that much easier when you have types, trust me. So many mistakes can easily be avoided with the typed language. Whenever I have to go back to JavaScript, my appreciation for TypeScript just rises immeasurably. In this tutorial series, I want to keep everything as general as possible. That's why I opted to use plain TypeScript instead of a framework like React. It's of course possible to use the viewer in other frameworks. As an example, I linked the React setup below. Um, if you have any issues with the integration of a viewer into a setup, just let us know in the forum. We are always happy to help. Okay, now let's talk about how you can access the viewer API. One way, which is definitely our recommended way, is via npm. npm is a software registry which offers an enormous amount of packages that you can use in web development. Do not have to code everything yourself. The ShapeDiver Viewer is just one of those packages. For the remainder of the tutorial series, I will use this approach, but it's easy to follow along whichever approach you choose. The other way to access the Viewer API is via CDN. In that case, you lose all of the advantages of TypeScript, but it is a more direct way to include the Viewer into the project. In this case, you just have to load the CDN into the body of your HTML with a script tag and restore the access to the API in global variables. As you can see here, I take the variable SDV ShapeDiver Viewer from the window object and can now use it to access all of the API features. Although this might not be a recommended way of doing things, it is definitely the easiest regarding setup. This setup is of course linked in the description and don't worry, all of the functions that you have just seen will be explained in a bit. Okay, before we start off with actual coding, I'll just quickly explain the setup. You can download this repository yourselves. Um, it's linked in the description. So there's not much to it. It's basically an npm setup and I have two scripts. One is the development script, which starts a development server and also has a watch for file changes so that whenever I do a change, you can automatically see the, the changes. And then it has just a script for building the production file. So that's already it. Before we start coding, let me just briefly explain what we are going to do today. In our first example, the goal is to create a connection with our servers to display the contents that we receive. To display the contents, we need a viewport. What is a viewport, you may ask? A viewport is a term we use for an instance to display the 2D and 3D content in a canvas. To actually get the content into this canvas, a session is needed. So, what is a session? 
Your models running on ShapeDiver are hosted on one of our geometry backend systems. The access to triggering customizations and downloading competition results is controlled by sessions. Don't worry, showing you how to do this is part of the tutorial series and we will get deep into this in one of the next videos. An important note, only if you have a plan starting from Designer Plus, you are able to access your models via the ShapeDiver Viewer API. A breakdown of the different plans is linked below. Alright, to start off, on the right side we have here a model that I uploaded to the ShapeDiver platform. Um, not much to this model, it's just one of my testing models. And we'll start off from scratch, so there's not much in the HTML file. We we'll just create a div and add some style to it to make it full screen. So I copy pasted here. <laughs> um, for the next thing, we just create a canvas um, because we need this canvas for the viewport, which I'll explain a bit later on. We just added a deer to be able to get that canvas. Um, the last thing is just to add a script tag to just reference or a bundle that basically we will have later on. All right, so you can see our TypeScript file is still empty. I still already starts the development build. As expected, there is currently nothing there besides the title. So the title fits, we can see it builds. So, all right, that's a start. In our TypeScript file, I first have to create an if <laughs> that's an immediately invoked function expression. Um, and this is done to basically already allow asynchronous functions inside of our code, even in the index file. So the first thing I'm doing is to get the canvas element that we have just defined in our index.html file by the ID that was specified. So it's pretty easy, just the get element by ID function on the document. And with that canvas, we can already create a viewport. So for that, we use the create viewport function, which returns a promise. And here, as one of the properties, I can just now assign the canvas element. And once I save this, it recomputes, and we already get our first result, a pulsing viewer logo. So there's currently just nothing to display in this viewport, so we have to create a session. So for the session, we have to now go back to the platform because we need the ticket for the model. So we can just go to the developers tab here and copy paste that. And then we also need the model view URL. And again, we can also just copy paste that. And once I now save this, we can have a look. And we see the model. Okay, so basically this was already the extreme minimal example of getting a shape of a model via the view API. Now let's look at some properties and see what we can do with them. First we start with the visibility property. So here I set the visibility now to instant and we see the model in in between steps already before it's completely loaded. So the instant visibility mode is probably something you would not use, but maybe there are some cases where you do. Setting it to manual means that you now have full control and can now set the viewport.show to true, whenever you want to show the viewport. So this is basically your visibility now. If I set it to false, it will just never be shown. And now we can use that to adjust our logo. So first of all, um, by setting the branding.logo property to null, no logo is shown at all. But that's not fun, so I now put in a logo that's a bit more fun. You, normally this would be used for any company logos that you want. Um, here I just use this cat astronaut. All right, so the next property I'm going to show you is the background color property. There's not much to it. Um, it's basically just a color. <laughs> so basically to make the viewport fit into your overall website, now change it to green, you can use any color you want. So with the logo and the background color properties, you can already 
have the loading of the viewer fit to your overall application. Okay, so for the next one, I'm going to use a function here that I will probably explain in a later video, which is the add flag function. This is now to set the busy mode to true. The busy mode is activated whenever our servers recompute something. So you can see this with the small ripple here on the bottom right, but I can also change where this ripple appears. So with the spinner positioning enum, I now set it to the left. As you can see, it's not left, but I can also set it to center, also to top left, top right, all of these options. So to not be in a way, I just set it to bottom left again. All right, but you might want to have a different option for that spinner. So you might not want this ripple effect, but want to have your own GIF. So I found a nice GIF for this YouTube video to put here instead, you probably want to use something a bit more professional. But yeah, for this video it just fits just fine. The PC mode spinner is always affected by the spinner positioning. So in this case it's bottom left, so that's why we see it on the bottom left. There are other options to display the PC mode. One is the blur option. So via PC mode display, I can now set it to blur, so whenever there something recomputes on our servers, the viewer now gets blurred. I can also set it to none, where basically nothing is shown, but yeah, that's not really exciting. For the session, I can decide if I want to load the outputs at all. Um, so if I set it to false, the outputs are just never loaded and I get an empty scene. Um, I can also decide if I want to wait for output. So this means if the promise is resolved before or after the outputs are loaded. So as you can see here, for a short time there was a, a white screen because the outputs were just not loaded. A property that is more interesting is the initial parameters property, where you can set the parameters that are initially applied to the session. So in my case, I copy pasted one of the IDs of my parameters. In one of the next videos, I will show you how to get this ID and I can set a value for it. So this is the length of this shelf and I now set it to 8, I can set it to 2, so you can see how this is affected. Depending on your models there will be different kinds of parameters that you can use and different kind of values you supply. Last but not least you can set the unique ID of your viewport and session. So if this is not a unique ID I will just create one internally and also if you don't supply one. This is just something where you can then at some point access the session and viewport that you have created. Alright, that was already it for today. You learned some terminology, something about the setup that is used and we created an initial example. Not bad for a start. In the next video, I will go deeper into the API for sessions and explain how to interact with them. This means changing parameters, reading out outputs and requesting exports. Stay tuned for that video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Happy coding and see you next time.